Hi, guys. <laughs> it's always kind of a mess to get your um, mask off when you're also wearing hoop earrings. I'm sure all of you in this room understand. <laughs> um, so I'm Emma. If I haven't had the chance to meet you yet, um, most of you I know in this room. And um, I'm really excited to be here. I can't get over how all of our chairs are back in the chapel, and we're also like getting to sit together and sing. I was like over where Sierra, hi Sierra, I love you, um, was a couple of weeks ago during our first pursuit, and I was just like sobbing the whole time because it's so good to be back together. Um, and so, like Megan said, I am be preaching from Luke today. I'm finishing up Luke um, in the Luke and Acts series. Uh, my friend Aaron Demos spoke last week, and I get to pick up in Luke 24, 13 through 35. And so I'm going to read the scripture. It's a lot, so hang with me, and then we'll pray. And then, um, yeah, hopefully I'll have something to say that's a meaning to you. So Luke 24, 13 through 35 it says, that very day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were walking, or they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to, him, said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some of our women in our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. When they did not find his body, they came back, saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but in him, or but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, O slow of heart to believe all the things the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. Jesus acted as they were going, he was going farther, but they urged him to they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us. For it is towards evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Let's pray. God, I come humbly before you, Lord. Um, Thank you for your word. Thank you for your scriptures. Thank you for Jesus, for the person of Jesus. Um, And I just pray in light of these scriptures that we um, would know you in um, the story of you breaking the bread and, and you walking with your disciples on the road. And that we would know you in our actions and our deeds to each other this week, God, um, as we we wrestle with hard things in this season, in this life, in this time, in our community, and in our nation, God. I pray that we would know you and that we would know the hope to which we are called. Amen. All right, so when we're looking at Luke, Luke is one of my favorite gospels. Um, I don't know if I should pick a favorite gospel. I don't know if that's bad, but it's one of my favorite gospels because, one, people eat a lot in Luke. Luke is super focused on table ministry. I wasn't supposed to say that. I was not even like indicative to the, mer- the message, but I love that they're always eating. And also, there's a travel theme in Luke. Um, Luke is sort of serving as an investigator, kind of like a journalist. So he relied mainly on eyewitness testimony um, to write the gospel of Luke. And so he's asking all these people, all these stories concerning Jesus. And so that's how the gospel of Luke came to be. And for some reason, he zeroes in on this story. There are probably a million stories he could have told, but this one he finds to be important. Um, It's focused on these two individuals and their encounter with Jesus. So it's Cleopas. Uh, I've yet to take a class at Northwest that teaches me how to say these names, so 
we'll see if I'm actually saying these right, but Cleopas and another disciple who is identified. We don't know their name. We don't know who they were. Um, but these two, they're making the seven-mile journey from Jerusalem to the village of Emmaus. I was going to joke that I was named after the village of Emmaus because my name is Emma, but then I like told my friends I was going to do that, and none of them laughed, like none of you are laughing right now, so I'm not going to make that joke. But um, they're walking to Jerusalem, and I kind of laughed when I read this because I don't know about you, but I have walked way more than I've ever wanted to in my entire life this year because there's nothing else to do. Um, like, I feel like over the summer, like, even in the winter, coffee shops are kind of open now, thank goodness, but you walk into a coffee shop and all the tables and chairs are stacked in the corner, right? So you get your coffee to go, and then you walk, and you walk, and you walk with friends. That's what I've been doing um, a lot. And so I just imagine them, um, they're walking to Emmaus. It's a seven-mile journey. Um, I don't know what the weather is like, but that's a long ways. Um, But I get the sense, and we get the sense from the scriptures, that they're not having a great day. Um, Jesus was just crucified um, a few days before. Um, It's Resurrection Sunday, so it's late in the afternoon, Resurrection Sunday. Um, The women, uh, Mary Magdalene, they had seen Jesus, um, but no one else in the wider circle, like these two are part of the wider circle of disciples, have seen him. And so um, they're walking, they're talking, they're communing with each other um, on the late afternoon. And because we know the whole story, you, we might expect them to be like holding their breath, right? And like leaning on the edge of their seat um, because we know that Jesus is about to appear to them and all is about to be made okay again. Um, but I think that they actually find themselves in a state of bewilderment. They don't actually know what's happening. Um, I think rather than holding their breath in expectation, they've exhaled in disappointment, in grief, confusion and sorrow, and I think they probably feel angry at the world and also maybe at Jesus because they might feel betrayed um, because he's the one they are following and, and what's happened now and they're left alone. Hope has seemingly disappeared and it had been because it had put to, been put to death two days prior. And so I can't even imagine the war going on inside of them against despair and against hope. Um, Little silver linings of like, okay, these women said that they saw them. They didn't believe the women. Go figure. Uh, (laughs) And um, they're they're just wrestling with like hope and despair. Um, And I I just, I, I imagine them in this space and this tension between brokenness and beauty because they knew Jesus. They had known the ministry of Jesus. They'd seen his works in the world. And so they knew the beauty of that. And also the past 72 hours of them has been really intense. So they've no doubt experienced the body and the comfort of the body um, of people. And, uh, but they're also, they don't know where Jesus is, right? Like the person of hope, the source of hope has disappeared. So they're in this tension between beauty and a lot of brokenness. Um, and Jesus, they don't know who he is yet, but he, the hope of Jesus invades that space between both brokenness and beauty. Between Hope against all hope and all the despair. Verses 15 through 17 said, While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? This echoes of where two or more are gathered, then that's where the Lord will be. Um, That's written later uh, in in the epistles, I believe. Um, Jesus, obviously, he knows the answer to those questions, right? He doesn't ask questions because he lacks answers. He's Jesus. He knows. Um, But he is aware of their sadness and their confusion and their own questions. And he just gives them space to process. Um, He gives them a chance to unburden themselves of all that's been weighing them down. Um, And they don't know it yet, but hope is accompanying them on their journey And so the very first thing he does is he holds space. He doesn't invalidate or refute our pain. He just asks, what's going on? He he does hold the answers, but he also holds hope. And I I can imagine that he probably wanted to immediately tell them because these are people that he probably knew and loved and was really close with. But he doesn't. Instead, he enters into their processing, into their communing, communing for a few minutes and into their conversation. And he remains in that tension of beauty and brokenness. Um... I think a lot of us have probably had a time where we knew that God called us to do something, we did it, but it wasn't super fun for us. 
Um, a couple years ago, I came to Northwest because I had decided to leave my other school, and I did not want to be here. I'm not going to lie. Like, I knew that God had asked me, and I knew that it was the right decision, and I felt peace about that, but I was so sad. The first um, fall, like before COVID, so last fall, not last semester, the fall semester before that, um, and I think that I kind of assumed, because I knew it was what the Lord wanted me to do, I kind of assume this, like, kind of self-righteous, like, well, the Lord told me, so, like, I'm just going to, like, suffer for it and be really ridiculous, super dramatic. Um, I knew that he had asked me, but I was in my dorm room in GPC. I don't know why I got put in GPC as a transfer, but it's okay. I'm I'm over it. Um, (laughs) I'm in my dorm room in GPC, and I'm crying, and I'm, like, so sad because I miss my friends, and I miss the sun, which is this thing that shines in a different state where I used to go to school. And the Lord, I just so clearly heard him say, "Um, I asked you to do a hard thing, but I didn't ask you to not hold space for that hard thing either. And that's what I see in this story. Jesus is just, what happened? Tell me about it. So he holds space for us, but he does correct us, however, when he reminds us um, when we've forgotten his promises and his words to us. And that's what he's doing here when he expounds the scriptures and he talks about um, what they would have known as the Torah. And verses 25 to 27 says, And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. The hope of heaven isn't cheap. It was hard fought. It requires sacrifice. And so as they walk and they talk, Jesus teaches these things about concerning himself. And it says he expounds the scriptures to them. And to expound is to kind of like set in front of and kind of let it speak for itself, but also present it. And so he explains, he teaches, he lets the events of the past several hours in the text speak for themselves in conjunction with each other. He's connecting dots for them. He, um, his words are steeped in the Old Testament. His teaching is perfect and incomparable and is explaining to them the connection between what they have heard from the scriptures and what they have seen in, in the past like 72 hours. He is reprimanding them, but I also think um, it, while simultaneously he's reprimanding them, but he's really calling them to a richer, realer, and more authentic type of hope than the hope that they had in the moment on the road. You and I have experienced, I think, several forms of cheap hope lately. Do you guys remember 15 days to stop the spread back in March of last year? Yeah, that was cheap hope. I, yeah, that was sad. Um, but this is not the type of hope that Jesus brings, and he shows this by tracing a line back through history. This type of hope isn't false or cheap, and it's proved by Scripture. There's a certain foundation and a certain concreteness about it. And they should have known, right? He could have, he could have been way harder on them, I think, because um, they were disciples of Jesus. They knew the, what, the, what Jesus was about. They knew what he was teaching the entire time during his ministry. But he reminds them of what they have been told. And they don't even know who this dude is. I don't know who they thought he was. Um, but he, he gives them one hope that kind of points to the future, And so if we go back to verse 21, um, I just found this phrasing um, interesting. It says, they're speaking to Jesus in the conversation, and they say, but we had hoped, past tense, that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. We had hoped. It's in the past tense. I know that I've had some things and some conversations running through my mind of things that were in the past tense that I no longer feel like I have hold on currently or in the future. All of their expectations, their hopes, their dreams of Jesus being who he said he was and who he had seemingly, what what he was going to do had vanished before their eyes. So hope, it feels like it's pretty in the past. They don't know where they're going to go moving forward yet. In reality, they had known hope all along. They had known the hope before Jesus was crucified in his ministry um, as he's walking the earth. They unknowingly, currently in their present moment, are walking with hope um, in the present, and hope is about to be revealed to them within the near, near, near future in the next few hours. This hope is living, and it resides in the past, present, and future tense. So it's true 
during his ministry, it was true even in the days before the resurrection because of what had been foretold in the scriptures. And it was true for the future when he broke bread. The hope that he offers is living. It's always working. It's always moving. Something's always happening. It's bubbling up. It's like the kombucha that my roommate's brewing right now in our kitchen. There's always something going on over there. Verses 30 through 31 says, when he was at the table with them, they're, they're at um, a house, presumably, in, in, in Emmaus, He took the bread and he blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. So interesting. When you look at the table ministry of Jesus, I always kind of think of him as like the homeless host because no one's ever at Jesus' house when they're eating with him. However, he always takes on the role of host at the table um, as was like according to Jewish customs. There's things that you can like go back and research um, because I'm a nerd, but... uh, he always takes the role of host when he's breaking the bread. And this meal is obviously indicative of communion. It's not just dinner um, for him. And it's, it's um, reminiscent of the Last Supper that he had had with the, tw- uh, the 12 in the upper room a few days before. And it's, but it's no longer symbolic of his suffering, but it also points to the future as well, to the future eschatological celebration of the kingdom, of the meal that we're all going to be at one day. So at the intersection of the physical breaking of the bread and the supernatural revealing of his identity, the hope that they once held in the past is launched into the present, into the future tense. It's no longer something of yesterday. Um, It's no longer old news. It's, It's now, it's here, it's living, it's for the future. So the explanation of the empty tomb, which is Jesus, is before them. And it's pointing to further fellowship, nourishment, to better days, and to eternity. I can't imagine how emotional it must have been for them to realize he was sitting in front of them. Um, they were sad. They'd had a really rough week, a really rough day. Um, and they'd been talking with a stranger who knows all, knows all these things and is, is teaching them. Um, and all of a sudden, as he's breaking the bread, something supernatural and also physical happens, and they realize that it's Jesus all along. Um, and then he vanishes. <laughs> And I just can't help but observe that when Jesus had disappeared from his death on the cross a few days before, hope had been lost. But when he disappears in front of them this time, hope isn't lost. It's 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 um, abounding. That's what I was looking for. It's running rampant all over the place. Um, It's so strong and tangible and real that they leave the table and they go back seven miles from where they just came to go to Jerusalem. Hope is the only thing that can make me do that, okay? It's probably like 9 o'clock at night, and I'm like eating. I do not want to walk seven more miles. And I came across this, um, just in thinking about hope and studying hope in this passage, I came across this uh, quote from Eugene Peterson from his book, Along Obedience in the Same Direction, and he says, Hoping does not mean doing nothing. It is the opposite of desperate and panicky manipulations, of scurrying and worrying. And hoping is not dreaming either. It is not spinning an illusion of fantasy to protect us from our boredom or our pain. It means a confident, alert expectation that God will do what he said he will do. It is imagination put in the harness of faith. It is a willingness to let God do do it his way and in his time. So I was preparing for this message, and um, I, all of us who are speaking uh, meet with a professor to go over our message, and I had um, Dr. Wisemore, most, most of us just know him as Jack, um, was meeting with me, and I was talking about hope, and I'm like, okay, like this, this is like what I want to say, and this is what I want to do, and he said, okay, um, think of someone who in your life has lost hope, and think about them as you're writing this message, and I was like, okay, I can do that. I want to be a pastor, so I'm naturally, I'm like, okay, I, think, I know this person, I know this person, and then I'm sitting yesterday working on this, and I was like, Emma, that person is you. Like, yes, it's the people around you, but you're the one that's lost hope a lot in the past year. You need this message, and um, man, I, I need a living hope. I don't know about you guys. Uh, I need to know in the midst of the beauty and the brokenness of my own life that my hope is not false and that I can depend on it for all of my days in the past, in the present, and the future. And in this season, you and probably uh, me and probably you too have exhaled, we've exhaled in disappointment. And I've been walking around in circles a lot of this year. But I don't want to leave my hope in the past tense. I don't want to rely on on statements. I don't want you and I to rely on statements like, well, I had hoped my parents would stay together, or I I had hoped that my senior year wouldn't be in COVID, or I had hoped, I had hoped, I had hoped. I want to hope. 
I want to know that my, my hope is in the future, ahead of me, steady, that I'm running into it every single day, even if I don't know what it's supposed to look like for me. And I think the biggest lesson that I've learned in my life, in the narrative of my life, in the past year especially, I think I'm just finding words to it now, is that beauty and brokenness coexist together in this life. They don't cancel each other out. Um, it's going to be like that on this side of heaven, on this side of the eschaton, uh, but that's where living hope invades. It, it lives in the space between beauty and brokenness. And I think the world would tell us that we have to believe one sole thing about something, that we have to categorize something as good, as bad, as woke, as canceled, who's on the inside and who's on the outside. But hope, without hope, we're never going to be able to wade through those waters. And I think the very first time I ever experienced hope in the middle of beauty and brokenness was when I was, I was giving a eulogy um, for a family member. And um, this family member was someone who I loved deeply, but who had also hurt me really deeply. Um, so it was all the more complicated. Um, and I remember standing on that stage in front of people that I knew and people I'd been raised with. And I, and I couldn't just talk about the beauty and I couldn't just talk about the brokenness, but I did have hope that there was better days ahead and there was hope in spite of that situation and that person. It's really easy for us to look for heroes and villains and to deem people as being so, but life is so much more nuanced than that. There's beauty in me and there's brokenness in me and there's beauty in you and there's brokenness in you. The hope of Jesus is a thing that we have to let invade our souls. And I really think that's where those two on the road to Emmaus were. They had seen the beauty of the kingdom and, and of all that God had done. But at the same time, brokenness is abounding. It's real. It's tangible. It's hard. Because the world had just brutally murdered the very source of their hope. But at the intersection of beauty and brokenness, Jesus steps in. Living hope steps in. It draws, us near, it draws near to us. It, it finds us along the road. It makes sense of the world in the ways it's supposed to. And it points us to the future. Jesus, our living hope, draws, us, draws near to us in our hurt, communes with us in our unanswered questions. Jesus, our living hope, is so quick to point us to Scripture and to the things that we have been told and to remind us of the faithfulness of our Father. Jesus, our living hope, points us to the future tense when all of it will be made beautiful, where redemption and restoration will be realized in full. Jesus is the hero and the hope of my story, and hope is not a mere concept of yesterday, but a close and present hope, drawing near to us, confirming the things that we have been told. It's enduring and living. It has been, it is, and it will be. I'm going to pray us out. God, May we know the words so well that we would recognize the hope in front of us and the hope set before us. May we receive the living hope, the living word among us that enters into our conversation, our thoughts, our community, and may we cling to it as we walk the winding ways of this life between beauty and brokenness. And in the spirit of Ephesians 1.18, I pray that the eyes of our hearts may be enlightened in order that we may know the hope to which he has called us to, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. We love you so much, Lord. Amen.